I've always thought that the mark of a good conference is it teaches you how little you know uh, and leaves you at the end much better informed. And on that basis, this conference has been the most spectacular success. And I think our gratitude is owed to Jens and the others who organized it and to this amazing panoply of speakers and panelists we've been listening to uh, over the last two days. Uh, my comments are brief, they're impressionistic. I apologize for the fact that they come from a lawyer, and even worse than that, an English lawyer, uh, so forgive my perhaps parochial view of life. What I want to do is simply pick out uh, some trends, as they, as they seem to me, and some ideas which seem to me to emerge uh, from the last two days. Uh, one is that Increasingly, there seems to be a general recognition that surrogacy is something which is there as a legitimate means of forming a family. But, of course, there is a very long way to go. Um, and the two demonstrations of that uh, are the Menison family, who spoke so powerfully yesterday, and the uh, Spanish-Ukraine issue, which has just been articulated. Um, and I'll come back to the international problem. Uh, one message which seems to come through uh, is that uh, the earlier uh, a state legislated, the more out of date that legislation is. And there are, in effect, two demonstrations of that. The fascinating historical survey we have given of the USA position was immensely illuminating. And the work which the law commissions in this country are doing very much goes to make the same point. I mean, our legislation in this country is elderly uh, by any standard. Uh, it only works uh, because of the judicial ingenuity which goes into making rules which are not fit for purpose um, actually work. So legislation is the way forward. Uh, anything to do with uh, reproduction nowadays, anything to do with surrogacy nowadays, uh, marches forward at an incre incredibly fast pace uh, so that legislation may become out of date very quickly, uh, reflecting both changes in science and changes in social attitudes. So the process of updating and keeping legislation up to date, I suspect, is an ongoing process which will not come to an end for a very long time. Now, we had, in terms of the programme, a very interesting conceptual distinction between four different approaches. And that analysis, I think, is very useful as a tool to understanding. But one of the impressions I've got is that in relation to the tolerant approach, the free market approach, and the regulatory approach, they are, in fact, converging fairly rapidly. Um, and although the American approach was placarded as the free market approach, um, I hope I won't offend our transatlantic colleagues by saying that, in fact, the emphasis of what we were listening to was very much on regulation. And the impression I have is that wherever we started from, we are increasingly moving towards uh, a process, an, uh, an approach, of which one might describe as regulatory. Now, there is, of course, the, uh, that leaves on one side uh, the uh, prohibitive approach, which I venture to suggest, it might be thought, is becoming increasingly anachronistic. What is very troubling about the uh, prohibitive approach is the very simple fact of life that when one comes to matters like uh, having a family, people will want to have families. And if they cannot have the family they want by staying within their own state, they will go abroad to find it. And the consequence of prohibition, whatever it is you're pro prohibiting, is that people will go to find what they're looking for. And the consequence of that, very well illustrated from different perspectives, both by the Mendelssohn family case and by the very interesting such we've just been listening to about the Spanish creative problems, uh, which um, our friend suggests are unfairly focusing on Ukraine. And I think he's suggesting that it's a Spanish problem, not a Ukrainian problem. But whatever it be, um, what those cases demonstrate is that the consequence of the prohibitive approach 
is to focus attention on what I'd call the rule of recognition. What in state A, whose people go to state B to have their child, is the rule of private international law which determines whether or not administrative or judicial processes in state B do or do not have recognition. And um, in essence, uh, we heard very interesting uh, uh, material from France, where because of the French domestic approach to this, the focus of the international private, private international law issue was in uh, applying um, the French concept of the birth certificate in the case where there was a foreign birth certificate. Um, it is a very real problem, and not least in this country, in England and Wales, where our rule of recognition is such, and it's very long established, our rule of recognition is such that no foreign determination in the surrogacy case, whether it arises by operation of the foreign law or by uh, operation of some foreign administrative process, or indeed some foreign judicial process, is recognized in England and Wales. Uh, and that is why we have the problem, which has been referred to more than once, of the limbo uh, between the child coming back, uh, stateless, parentless in English law, and the point at which the parental order is made, if indeed the parental order is ever, is ever made. Now, um, that is a very big problem. What's the way forward? Well, the impression I have uh, is, as I say, that increasingly the view is, unless you're a prohibitionist, one wants to move to some system of regulation. And one question which arises, and it's very neatly encapsulated uh, in the comparison between what we were told about what goes on in the Republic of South Africa, uh, and uh, on the other hand, the uh, UK Law Commission's proposals, is the question of whether the process should take place before conception or after the birth. And as I understand it in uh, the Republic of South Africa, uh, it is a pre-birth process. Uh, and as you were told yesterday, the pathway being proposed by the England, English and Scottish Law Commissions is again for a pre-birth process. In contrast, of course, the current English position is a post-birth process, which is the very thing which creates the limbo and all the other problems. So that one great question seems to me to be is if, if one is going to move to the regulatory position, uh, does one adopt as a matter of principle a pre-birth process or an ex post facto process? And I have the impression uh, from listening to the various contributions and papers that the consensus seems to be moving towards a pre-birth rather than a post-birth process. Now, that, it might be thought, uh, is probably right uh, for two quite distinct reasons. One is that you can only have, I suspect, real protections um, if there is an effective process of regulation pre-conception. And the reason for that, as we have discovered in this country, and Lucy hinted at it just a few minutes ago, is if you have a post-birth process uh, and the judge is presented, uh, if it's a judicial process, ex post facto with a live child who is living with X and Y, um, if you don't make the order, then the consequence in a jurisdiction like ours is that the child remains parentless and maybe stateless in a complete li legal limbo. And therefore, whatever attention we pay to welfare, however carefully the welfare reports put together, however much you try and focus uh, on the best interest of the child, I suspect, and this seems to accord with a lot of discussion we've heard over the last two days, that the best protection for the best interests of the child is by a pre-birth rather than a post-birth process. Sorry, preconception rather than a post-birth process. Now, another question which arises, and I'm identifying uh, issues rather than necessarily providing the answers, is should the process, whether pre-conception or post-birth, be a judicial process or an administrative process? 
Uh, and there we have the instant contrast between the South African model, which is unequivocally a judicial process, and on the other hand, we have the proposals of the United Kingdom Law Commissions for a process which is not judicial and one might describe as being administrative. Now, which is better? Um, that is not a matter I'm going to hazard an answer to, um, although it may surprise you to think uh, to hear that I've often thought, as a, even as a judge, that there are many things better left to mechanisms which are not judicial. But it does seem to be, be an important question, and it's one which uh, the law commission has come to a very clear view on. Uh, and uh, it is interesting to have the contrast. And that's one of the great advantages of these conferences. One discovers what's going on elsewhere. Now, given the problems, in particular the international, uh, private international law recognition problems uh, in relation to international surrogacy arrangements, what is the way forward? Well, one approach, I suppose, is model laws. Uh, and if one's going to have model laws, they have got to deal with two separate issues, uh, it seems to me. The domestic, what should the domestic law be? What should the minimum requirements within a, the domestic law of state be? But even more critically, if one's going to have model laws, one needs model laws dealing with the rules of recognition, the public international law rules, and governing the consequences of a transnational international surrogacy. Uh, and uh, the more I listen uh, to what we heard about the Hague uh, conference approach and the comments, it does seem to me that probably uh, that is our best chance of get moving forward and getting workable rules, uh, at least in relation to the recognition, recognition issue. And I suspect that given the different views held in different countries about the goodness or the badness, the appropriateness or the inappropriateness of surrogacy, uh, views which are often affected uh, by cultural, religious, social, historical things, uh, it is going to be difficult to establish any kind of international consensus on the substantive content of domestic law, unless it is, uh, as has been suggested, to establish minimum requirements of an appropriate regime. Uh, it may be that the single most important way forward is to encourage the Hague uh, machinery to move as fast as possible to some internationally, and that's not a criticism of them, um, these things take, take time, and we were delicately hinted at that the uh, activity of the Hague expert group is determined, the pace is determined by what governments do. Uh, but um, given that the Mendelssohn family case and the Spanish thing which I've been hearing about uh, are so fundamental in terms uh, of the human consequences uh, for the people involved, it does seem to me that what is a lawyer, uh, I call the rule of recognition, uh, the, private, the private international law rules, are those which most urgently need our attention and which may soonest get us to where we need to get to. I mean, it was profoundly moving um, listening uh, to the members of the Menson family yesterday, uh, as indeed it was listening to the other presentations by women who have been actually involved in the process uh, to realize, bringing home to us, the human realities of all this. Um, and when one just pauses to think, we heard hints of it this morning in the presentation of the research from India. We've heard it in the last few minutes in terms of the Spanish families who are uh, trapped in uh, Ukraine and Georgia and elsewhere, because of the actions of their own government, it appears, uh, the human misery uh, it must be immense. Uh, and although, of course, as family lawyers, we all think that the interests of the child are paramount, um, you can't have a happy child if you've got a miserable parent. Uh, and one can't ignore the 
dare I say, inhumanity uh, of a system of international non-regulation, which permits what earlier was described as a wild west, if the consequences of that um, are that, uh, to take up the example we just heard about, uh, there are Spanish families trapped in, in Ukraine, and not, as far as I can understand, the responsibility of Ukraine directly. Uh, uh, now, just two final observations. I mean, it's easy to analyze this in legal terms, particularly if you're a lawyer. But I mean, two big issues, which have been hinted at from time to time over the last couple of days, uh, but which perhaps, uh, because they're so distressing to think about, are the elephants in the room, are first of all, looking at from one point of view, the risks of exploitation uh, of surrogate mothers. Um, and, uh, we have all known uh, in our professional careers of the most shocking exploitation in the context of international adoption uh, of mothers in uh, financially deprived circumstances, uh, mothers in what's conventionally called third world or developing countries who have been the victims of exploitation. Um, and it would be idle to imagine that that is not going on even as we speak in the context of international surrogacy. Um, and it was a very interesting, illuminating analysis we had this morning uh, of the research which we were given a preview of in relation to sur the surrogates, the surrogate mothers uh, in Gujarat. Well, that's one side of the issue. The other side of the issue, which was touched upon yesterday, and this goes to the question of what should the regulatory mechanisms be, what should the protections be, is that because regulatory systems, particularly if they involve judicial proceedings, cost money, any system of that sort is privileging the wealthy over the less wealthy. So behind all the legal analysis, behind many things we've been talking about, there are two issues, both which go uh, reflect wealth on the one hand or deprivation on the other hand, which one can't help feeling, uh, do have a significant role to play. So uh, we need to think about that. Uh, and the cost of regulatory systems, particularly if they involve judicial proceedings, uh, uh, are perhaps matters to be taken into account when one considers what kind of system one wants for the future. Uh, if we want a regulatory system, how pervasive, how expensive, I mean, the American systems we, we've heard described are immensely impressive. Uh, they are, to use a well-worn English analogy, the absolute Rolls-Royce um, approach. But when one hears that, for example, uh, part of an American regulatory process uh, is that the intended parents uh, are expected to foot the bill for all the services being provided to the surrogate mother, uh, some of them on a regular basis, uh, it does raise very starkly the issue. I have no idea what the answer is. It does raise very starkly the issue. Um, well, that is a system which, as the price to be paid for achieving the right solution in one direction, is actually uh, creating uh, a privilege for the wealthy, which is denied to the less wealthy. Now, those are just a few random thoughts. Um, I'd like to think that in three or four years' time, gents, you can organize uh, another conference um, where, um, on this topic, where there'll be fewer storm clouds and where we'll have a tremendous report from the Hague Conference, but who knows? But um, for the moment, and I must shut up if you want your lunch, um, thank you all very much for coming here. I hope you've all enjoyed it as much as I have, uh, and uh, a tremendous vote of thanks. James, to you and your teams, um, the speakers, and not forgetting the foot soldiers, uh, if I could call them that, who have so helped, uh, been so helpful to us in pointing us in the direction to go, and so on and so forth. Thank you all very much indeed. I've gone away much better informed, I hope a little wiser. Um, you probably knew it all already, but um, anyway, there we are. Many, many thanks to all of you.